All right, major burns. So uh, remember the rule of nines, right? This is when you talk about body surface area. So I love these reference slides because it's super helpful, um, but easily breaks it down. Um, now with children, so remember that, you know, children have slightly different distributions because of, you know, the proportions, particularly their heads. And so you can take a look here and it breaks it down basically like one to four, five to nine and 10 to 14. And then in infants less than one year, you can see that their head takes up 21 percent because of its size so just an, another important thing to think about as a reference what are the ATLS recommendations from 2018 for fluid resuscitation and burn so if you've got an over 20 percent TBSA burn uh, deep partial thickness burn or full thickness burn they talk about two mls per kilogram times a percent BSA per day of lactated ringers in adults or three for kids um, you want to give the half of the volume over the first eight hours and the rest over the ensuing 16 hours in a 24-hour in a day. If there are electrical burns, you got to increase the fluid volume, and you want to maintain a urine output that's brisk, so greater than one ml per kilo per hour. So let's talk about burn center admission criteria. So this may depend on your practice setting and social parameters. So, you know, patients who have a lower socioeconomic uh, standing, you know, you want to have a lower threshold to admit these patients because they may lack access to care. All second degree burns greater than 10% of body surface area may, be, may get admitted. Um, third degree burns, unless extremely small, tend to get admitted. Um, you know, beware of inhalation injuries. You want to look for... Uh, uh, seared nasal hairs, um, you know, if you can see soot in the mouth, um, you know, you want to secure the airway early if necessary because they can have delayed edema, but these patients should get admitted and observed. Um, if you have burns to things like face, right, ear, eyes, hands, um, genitalia, so any major joints, these patients may tend to get admitted. Electrical burns, um, circumferential burns, and we're going to talk about compartment syndrome, but also patients who have comorbid conditions conditions, right, so who are at risk um, for worsening, uh, you know, progression or um, decompensation, and then little kids, right, kids less than one year old tend to get observed more frequently. How about some burn complications? So inhalational lung injury is a horrible thing. Uh, you can have airway burns, you can have systemic toxicity from inhaled toxins like carbon monoxide and cyanide, uh, you can get bad ARDS, pulmonary infections, septic shock. Uh, clinical scenario really determines the risk, but the bottom line is you should have a low threshold to intubate if you need to, uh, so that at least the patient can get an endobronchial exam to look for airway injury and edema. And think about uh, toxicity. So, you know, as a rule, uh, carbon monoxide toxicity is usually a more insidious thing, uh, and cyanide toxicity is a sudden and dramatic thing, you know, may present as something like unexplained and persistent lactic acidosis after resuscitation. So who gets an escherotomy? So patients who have a full thickness circumferential burn in a limb, and the concern is uh, similar with compartment syndrome, right? If patient has poor pulses or poor capillary refill, um, so this patients would have this as an indication. If you have full thickness burns to the chest wall area, um, this can uh, you know decrease ventilation, and so these patients can get an escherotomy. You can take a look at the picture; they're just showing you the area in which you can perform it, and. And um, when you do it, you can hear this painless pop, and this is where you get the sub-Q um, tissue that's expanding, and typically bleeding is minimal in these patients. Yeah, I actually, I actually did one of those, Jess, as a second-year resident at like 2 o'clock in the morning in the burn unit with a copy of Roberts and Hedges open in front of me like spies like us, um, and thankfully everything went okay. All right, um, chemical injury overview, right? So... Acids cause a coagulant necrosis and alkali cause a liquefaction necrosis. So as a rule, if you had to have a chemical burn, you'd rather have it from an acid than an alkali. Uh, these things are found all over the place, the home, the workplace. Um, acid burns, unfortunately, have become a thing that's uh, used in assaults. Um, but usually it's an occupational exposure or an accidental exposure, maybe exploration by a little kid or something like that. The mainstay is irrigation if it's on skin. Uh, if it's ingested, don't give things that cause you to vomit, right? Because you're re-exposing your esophagus to injury, increasing pressure, causing an aspiration risk. Um, you want to maybe check basic labs, add some calcium, CK, and coags, and, and most of the care uh, is supportive. 
All right, what about hydrofluoric acid? So you'll, you will more commonly see these in industrial settings. Um, also, patients who do glass etching can get them. And they tend to get deeper wounds and with minimal skin changes. So this is kind of like the pain out of proportion to what you see on exam. Um, the key thing to remember for the exam is you can get systemic hypocalcemia, and you may have an exam that appears normal, so something to think about. You can treat it with calcium gluconate, and there is a topical gel, or you're going to infiltrate with 5 to 10%, um, and this binds to fluoride. The important thing to remember is not to infiltrate with calcium chloride, because this can be toxic to tissues. And then obviously, you're going to treat your pain with pain medication. How about radiation injuries? So um, this could be external exposure. Um, this could be inhaled or ingested. Right, I think one of the scenarios that likes to um, appear on tests is things like a so-called dirty bomb where some radioactive material is uh, packaged with a conventional bomb to help ex expose more people. Um, GI and hematologic symptoms are the most vulnerable. Um, in general, uh, the earlier the symptoms and the higher the dose, the worse the prognosis. So safety contamination is kind of a vital part of the assessment and treatment. You've got to protect personnel. Ideally, you'd be doing this in like a decon tent setting or, or external decontamination station. You want to remove clothing and store it so that it doesn't cross-contaminate other people. Wash the skin off with warm soapy water, clean nails and hair. Uh, internally, think about activated charcoal or possible whole bowel irrigation if you don't know what's been ingested. Um, there are some chelating agents that can be used for radioactive heavy metal poisoning, including uh, potassium iodide for iodine-131 ingestion, uh, but otherwise the care is primarily supportive. And here's a, a nice reference slide about uh, acute radiation toxicity. Um, you know, you might have something like this somewhere in your ED if you're near a nuclear power plant, and it talks about the hem hematopoietic syndrome, GI syndrome, or cardio-CNS syndrome, what the dose is, onset, and symptoms. Um, and uh, this is a good thing to be searchable in your index.